Hi, welcome, Reshma and Jason, and everybody on the call. Yeah, I, yeah good to be hi, on. Hi. My gosh, I am so excited to chat with the two of you, pioneers in the field of synthetic biology. So to kick us off, the audience today is going to be a mix of people with a tech background and a bio uh, background. Can you tell us a little bit about what Ginkgo does? Sure. Yeah, I can. I can do it. Uh, yeah. So I'll, I'll say it from the tech lens and then from the from the bio lens. So uh, from the tech lens, you can you can think of us kind of like Amazon Web Services, right? Big centralized facilities that can be accessed as a service, so that you can bring your product to market more easily, right? In our case, instead of a giant data center like Amazon, it's a highly automated lab here in Boston, right? So about you know, in this building we're in here, about 250,000 square feet of highly automated labs that you could, if you want to start a new company and not build out a bio lab, you could essentially leverage our infrastructure to do your, your cell engineering. Okay, so that's the tech side. If you're a bio person, and in biopharma, there are organizations called contract research organizations, CROs, where people outsource certain types of research. Traditionally, biopharmas outsource like an animal study or, uh, you know, a, uh, making a small molecule uh, chemistry to like Wuxi or to Charles River. It's kind of like work they don't want to do, basically. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of like standardized work that it's just like, I'd rather someone else did this. Our argument to these biopharma companies is because of our automation and scale, we can do things that they can't do in-house. So they should actually outsource to us to get access to a scale that isn't available in their internal labs. So that's sort of the, the tech and the bio. But either way, the idea is outsource services, uh, a platform business model like you would, you would see in a lot of tech companies to enable other people's products. Fantastic, thank you. And what year did the two of you get started and what's the, the current state of the company? So we got started in 2008. Um, we were virtual for the first year um, and then um, managed to open our first lab in 2009 um, and bootstrapped for several years um, with no outside funding whatsoever yeah. until actually our first outside money in was basically part of YC. My yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, um, we were a little bit weird. It was like <laughs> six. I mean, we, didn't, we were summer 14 yeah. uh, class of YC, but had been bootstrapping the company for five years before that, which is like buying equipment on eBay, <laughs> like moving into the cheapest part of Boston, like building a <laughs> Getting getting some guys from South Boston to put in some plumbing into an office space. <laughs> it was it was not uh, it was not the you know a lot of biotech start fancy. Uh, that was not the start of Ginkgo Bioworks. I would say, um, but yeah, but I, I think that served as well actually. Now as we have a lot more capital, it did. Yeah, yeah. It it bakes frugality into your culture from the yeah. get go. That you that is even fifteen years later is still there. We still don't <laughs> like to spend money. <laughs> Lessons, lessons for yeah. Scrappiness and resourcefulness, such important lessons for all of the aspiring founders on the call today. And, and so take us back, you know, a lot of folks who are wanting to start companies, one of the first things they do is they look for a co-founder, you know, and the two of you have had such a successful co-founder relationship for such a long time now. Tell us a little bit about how the two of you met and how did you guys know you wanted to work together? So Ginkgo actually has five founders. Yeah. <laughs> so Which is why, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you only get two of the five on this one. Um, yeah. That's one of the reasons we work so well together. The first thing is we want to point out that there's five of us. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and we all met at MIT. Uh, so four of us were graduate students there. And then my PhD advisor is the fifth founder. And uh, we actually showed up slightly different years at MIT, but all kind of fell in love with was with what was just getting going as a new academic discipline, synthetic biology. And, and so that's kind of how we all met and started working together. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll tell you about, about like what SynBio is in a minute, but, but uh, I would say in terms of starting a company with your thesis advisor, so like, like why, why see obviously sees a lot of companies getting started in the tech industry where it's all just, you know, straight out of undergrad, like, you know, whatever, boot up a website, boot up an app, you know, um, I think for like these sorts of like hard technology or, or deep technology or real technology, uh, as I would call it, companies frequently are going to have a um, uh, like a 
a scientist PhD person, you know, advisor in the mix, right? Like the, the technology is coming out of a lab or something like that. And one of the things I would advise folks to think about is, uh, can you get your thesis advisor to leave? The university and join your company full time. That that is a true signal. Did you did did you do that successfully? Indeed. Yeah, yes, man. Yes. Tom left MIT well, and yeah. is still at the company today. <laughs> I mean, that that's hard to do to pull people out of academia like that. So, any tips? Because a lot of my bio founders are facing this right now, actively facing this. Yeah, I mean, my my main view on it would be, I think it is hard, right? So, a, I think if you're like a venture capitalists and you see that happen, it's actually a really great underappreciated signal of a company that's a big deal, right? Because those are like, you know, it's a big deal to leave an academic spot. It's like, you know, it's a big deal. It is a real thing. Um, but but uh, um, if they don't, which is most common, the bigger issue is like, not really a founder, you know, right? So I think there's like a weird dynamic that happens in like the like biopharma space where you have these people who are like, I'm the founder of like 27 companies because I'm like such and such, you know, my, my professor. Like like that that that's not like it's not founder. It's like why Combinator would think of founder. It shouldn't be yeah. more equity at, at, by any stretch of the imagination. Like 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 you know, unless they're leaving, you know, if you want to really build a company with the Y Combinator model, like a Google scale company with the with founder led leadership that, that is like not messing around you don't want to waste that equity and also like moral authority on someone that's not joining the company full time so it's great to have the advisor they should get something but it's just different yeah it's completely different i can't tell you how many uh applications we get at the yc bio program where there's a professor that has 30 percent of the company and then the founders asked me to get on a call with them, with this mucky muck, and say, well, can you negotiate them down? We don't want to, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, super, yeah, yeah. it's super awkward because like, you know, you might not have graduated yet, so they might be like control whether your PhD thesis yeah. goes through or not, yeah, you know? So it is like very challenging. But yeah, yeah I mean, if, you're, if you're spending your whole, like if you're working full time at a company and they're not, that's like just a very different a level of investment of, you know, life energy. So yeah, it's, like, it's, very it's in the interest. It's even in their interest, to be honest, because like, again, I think YC, God bless. This is what you you all like really were. I mean, remember we're 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 old, right? Like 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 we started Gingo, in, you know, in, in two thousand and eight. Okay, right? And like, there there wasn't even good like founder um, forward content on the internet. There there was a, there was a blog called um, Venture Hacks. That like uh, what's his name, you know, who now who ended up doing Angel List, like was writing, and and that was like one oasis in the desert, and the other was like Paul's essays, and like we were like voraciously reading these things because everybody else we talked to, it was all like completely VC centric advice, right? And, and and so I think like the model that Y Combinator pioneered, a big part of it is understanding like the power of like founder led companies where there's real ownership and like, and what, then that, that lets it run. Like, how do you want You want to get a Microsoft or a Google. You can't just hire in like a professional CEO from the VC firm. It's not how you get Microsoft's and Google's like, it just doesn't yeah, work. Right. And, and so you just admit it. Right. So, so if you're a professor, you actually want that equity to be worth something, give it to your students, you know, right. And, and take a much smaller piece like that or leave and join full time. Right. Like otherwise you're just holding it back. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with that. I um, have been entangled in several of those very fun discussions. So, I, so after all the time, it, it, it's yeah. like, they, they just, they don't see the lot, like people are very short term minded, right? Yeah. They're like, well, obviously the X percent is bigger than Y percent. You're like, yeah, but there's like eight fall on effects to you making that decision. Right? Yeah. Like, so, yeah. Yeah. Just so speaking of founder, founder led companies, how do you, do you think that looks different for bio companies versus tech companies? We're sort of fighting this ingrained culture of very quickly replacing the founding team, right? With so and so, you know, professional CSOs or CEOs and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, biotech VCs historically have this kind of tradition of like finding a technology in a lab. You do probably take the best students and postdocs from that lab and get them started, but then you pretty quickly bring in professional management in over them. Um, and part of the reason they can do that is because, like, 
they're the first money in, they probably own like 30, 40, 50% of the company. And so they do have like they're a ton of control, right? And so, um, but I think if you can flip that model where like, if you can bootstrap a little while, right? Or, you know, get creative about your early funding and, and rely on non-dilutive funding, that gives you a little bit more flex to like avoid that model and actually have the founders like stay in control. And then you have to yeah. kind of do the typical thing of like being on a very steep learning curve as a founder to kind of build the skills you need to run the company yourself, right? You don't get it by fiat, you get it because you earn it. But, um, yeah. um, but uh, you know, uh, YC has been sort of helping to like move the needle on that. <laughs> um, hasn't happened quite as quickly as it has in tech, but I think it is moving that direction. <laughs> And, yeah, I hope so. Uh, yeah, uh, two two things to that: one general and one self-serving. Uh, so, so uh, you know, Rachel pointed out like that bootstrapping thing, right? Like, like so, Ginkgo's you know the first ten million or so dollars in the Ginkgo was, was grants, right? We started the company in two thousand eight. We were we were coming straight out of school, which like we were the first bi y YC biotech company. Now it's more common, and then but like back when we were, there was, there was very few like. Um, uh, straight out of grad school founders. And so we couldn't have raised venture capital if we wanted to, right? right. Like consequence, 100%, like the reason we actually, by the time we raised money, we had already created a lot of the value, we had a lot more leverage in those negotiations. And so we were able to, to not have that situation where, well, the, in order to start this company, it's gonna cost $10 million. I'm not gonna give you $10 million for a small percentage of a brand new company, it's too much money, right? So it's, it's really the, the starting costs of a biotech that are part of the problem. And I think it's no surprise that like YC came into its own right alongside like cloud computing infrastructure and internet, because it dropped the cost of starting companies, right? And app stores and the whole thing, like all the costs for, for doing web fell. And so suddenly there wasn't a gatekeeper who had to give you $10 million to start your internet company. You could start it like, you know, on the first YC deals were like, what, what if they get probably like $35,000 or something like, like it was like, yeah, yeah, it was like and, and so like that, that was part of why, like you've even had a shot because otherwise the gatekeepers were like, well, no, you know, right. Like I'm just not going to allow it. And you had, and you needed the money to start an internet company. So now the self-serving half, if you are starting a sin bio company, I recommend you use Ginkgo's infrastructure. Okay. <laughs> it will make it much less expensive. To launch the company like we are we're really trying to, to I, I think this is one of the reasons you don't see founder-led biotech as much it's, it's just the upfront costs are too expensive so everyone who has managed to pull that off has done it through some crazy scraping and blah 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 and the ebay and the you know like it's brutal right it's just expensive to start a lot yeah and the in the last couple of batches it's felt very different for me funding companies with five hundred thousand each versus one hundred twenty five thousand. you know of course it makes a difference if you're a tech company but especially if you're in our space that incremental increase means a lot right yeah. so going back to your fundraising journey a little bit i sort i love this founding story of ginkgo of a bootstrapping finding yc and then doing two sizable rounds in close succession to one another, right? So first, after bootstrapping for a while, how did you decide to join YC? What was the thought process there? And then what was it like fundraising after that point? Uh, so Sam Altman had wrote a blog post that was like, I think YC should, it's good. Yeah, I'm going to have YC fund things that aren't software companies. Okay. And I, and I, I like just wrote Sam. I was like, I didn't know him from Adam. But I was like, oh, you know, Thank, thank you. Like, just <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like, Ginkgo is like two, you know, like we've been around for five years, whatever. We're based in Boston. We got like 20 people in a lab out here. It wouldn't make sense for YC, but like, thank you so much for just like being willing to, to like apply, like, like to like someone else to fund bio that isn't like trying to develop a therapeutic. Right. Like, you know, like just that's, it was like water in a desert, you know? Uh, and he was like, Oh, you could do you know like you could do YC of Sam. He's like good at selling, right? He's like you, you know you should do you could do it. Like come out, come out, meet me, you know, right? And so like we went out and met Sam, and then after that I was like, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, uh, so, so that that was it. That, that, that's how we ended up at YC. It was like because that blast went out and like this is too. That's awesome. That's such a great thing for early founders to hear because I think sometimes when you put things like that out in the universe, like just a thank you. That's what it takes to unlock the power of serendipity, right? You just yeah. never know in the early days 
what conversation is going to lead to what outcome. It's pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, I agree with that. The, the, the other thing I would say is like, um, especially when it's like things you just like believe in, right? Like I think a lot of what's worked over the years for us has been like, you know, the, the, like back when we were at MIT, it was like the beginnings of this field of synthetic biology, which you can think of a little bit like DNA as digital code. And why don't we bring in some of like the theories of like, you know, computer science and engineering more directly into biology rather than starting with the biology, right? Like start with the code and then see what can apply to the biology rather than understand how a cell works and work backwards, right? And so, so right. we, you know, we just believe, you know, like Tom and Drew, like you know, Drew Rendy was my boss, like, like they really like inspired us to care about this. And then like that, a lot of Ginkgo success has been just like making authentic bets on that. Like in yeah, terms and of people we hired, like in terms of like like decisions about business model, the company, like investors we brought in, like it was really like if you really authentically believe in it, like just don't be afraid, like like it, it you know. Well, I think it helps you take risks, yeah. right? Because you're like, oh, I'm gonna do this because I believe it's the right thing to do, and you know it's the path forward. And so your risk tolerance is sort of different because 100%. you're just like, well this is what I believe. And so I'm going to go after that. And, you know, whereas if you were trying to like build a financial model to justify the decision, you like might never do it. Right. So 100%. Yeah. Because I mean, there's so many hurdles as an entrepreneur that unless you genuinely authentically believe in what you're doing, you're going to stop at some point. Right. And yeah, I mean, you just got to have like at a certain degree of like perseverance slash fortitude. And so believing what you're doing massively makes that easier. Yeah, yeah there's yeah, like a absolutely. lot of work the way where like, we're like, oh, well, we couldn't live with ourselves if we didn't like make this bed, right? Like, you know, like, 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 yeah. we'd be like down synthetic biology, you know, like, like, that's, like, yeah. that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> but like, that's what it felt like, you know, like, we're like, oh, I'm going to go through it. Like, you know, like, like be so disappointed in us. Yeah. 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 No, it's like, I can't better. see myself doing anything else. This is what I'm meant to be doing. There's a lot of risk, right? Like, we had, remember, like, the other thing that was brutal, making the jump to taking measure money, it was like, I mean, we, we had just, like, scraped for a long time, right? So, so like, there was a lot of sweat equity in this thing. And then it was kind of like, we take all this money, and now you're making bets where, like, if, if, if it's wrong, you're like you're so far over your skis. It's like, oh my gosh, like, you know, the whole thing is all far. You're like, man, I, I'm just like, man, you know what the last six years were like? Like, like, you know, like a lot, you know, like you're applying for grants, you don't know if you're gonna get the money, you're like trying to keep employees, they don't really want to stay, you know, like it, it's tough, right? Like that, so, so we really felt like we had like a lot on the line, you know, and it, I, I agree with Rachel, like without like really feeling like you were doing it for some other reason, you never would have made it, you would have been too risk averse. Yeah. So what did it feel like to make that transition from going from being bootstrapped to then raising oversubscribed rounds and, you know, two rounds in one year, right? Or very close together? Yeah, I just did the fundraising. Richmond did the money spending. So what was, what was it like? Uh, what did they change about that culture? Well, you know, what was what I think was an interesting transformation the company went through is like, yeah, we had bootstrapped for so long, right? So the employees who had joined us, like they just kind of joined us on faith, I think on some level, right? Like they were like on some level just bought into like, hey, yeah, let's give this thing a whirl too. Um, and then like we raised all this money and all of a sudden there's this opportunity to kind of build and invest in things that like we just didn't have the cash to do so previously, right? And so it was like, we were like talking about like, oh, like we were 20 people, okay, we're gonna be 40 people by the end of the year. And like there were people were like, no freaking way like we don't even know how to scale like we like we've been hiring like one person a year for, you know or one person at tw twice a year so like, one person a year i love and it so like yeah like we've been just growing so organically and slowly that people like didn't think we could switch into like yeah. a, like a faster pace of doing things right they were just like it's impossible like we, we don't have a muscle yeah right yeah. and so like we're afraid of the cultural change it would create yeah right? or yeah oh yeah totally afraid like what is this going to do to us like what how are we going to be a different company and whatnot and like but what was cool is for all the people who were there at that time they saw this like i thought this thing was impossible but then we went and did it and so that like completely opened their minds to like the possibilities of like tackling the impossible right because like again at some, at some point you have to like kind of believe like hey, I can build this muscle, I can like leap off this cliff and build the plane on the way down, right? Um, and we will start flying. And so that like, 
going from like, you know, having a, a scientist or an engineer declare something impossible and then you as an organization pull it off and then you're like, oh, yeah. wow, like I, like I was wrong about that. And so then all of a sudden those are, you know, some of the folks are, who are still here today who are like willing to make the biggest leaps because yep. they went through this incredible transformation of like thinking we couldn't do something and then we did it, right? Yeah, and then I think it's like extra hard when it comes to like, um, like for again, I'll say for like, deep tech or real tech, you know? And what I mean by this is like- I love that. Yeah, like real, real tech. tech. Yeah. You're like real, you're like real company. <laughs> you build actual things. No, 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 no. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I'll, be, I'll be more effective than, than that to my to, uh, to Silicon Valley. But like, I would argue that like, and this is starting to change. Like, I think some of the stuff that like, you know, I like what Sam's doing with OpenAI and stuff like that. But, but there was a window where like, the bulk of what Silicon Valley was doing was taking market risk, right? Like. Will grown adults ride scooters? That's <laughs> right? That's market risk. Okay. Can you build a scooter network run by your phone? Of course. Right? Like, like there's not like it's just spend the money, hire the engineers, get the scooter network, right? Like there's not there's no, no technical risk, it's not Intel. Okay, right? Like, you know, they will ride uh, them, they will lose them, they will throw right? them into yeah, the ocean. Like all yeah. market risk, all market risk, right? Yeah. Whereas, oh, or you're gonna develop a Alzheimer's drug, zero market risk all technical risk right okay right. right like you might try your best you're not making it and it, you just might fail because it is scientific and technical risk that is real tech okay like real technology it has risk okay right like it, it, it like you're calling yourself tech as you use software but there's no there's no risk embedded in it okay you're just you're actually just a marketer effectively right you're a product developer and that right. became the culture of silicon valley and, and, and so so you know I would argue that all these companies that that are building real tech, they have to they have to have good scientists and engineers. You know what makes a good scientist and engineer? Raging skeptic, raging skeptic. Okay, <laughs> right. Like, and, and so you have this, in, which is not the case for product, right? Great product, they're like you know they're visionaries, the dreamers, right? But that is not not what makes a good drug developer. Okay, right? Like good drug developer is big time skeptic. And, and so that actually runs in. So how do you? Balance those two things in in terms of like building the culture at Ginkgo, like the yeah, having that right? side yeah, and yeah. having that dreamer side and having that business side. And now you guys are publicly traded, so there's yeah. the street side of it, you know. Yeah, no, it's incredibly hard because you're basically trying to establish an unstable equilibrium where you want to maintain that skepticism, okay? Because yes. that's how you do rigorous, like top shelf science and engineering. But you also want to have ambition and to have that dream because that's how you achieve more than you technically think is possible, right? And so trying to maintain that unstable, unstable equilibrium between those two very stable states is very challenging. Yeah, and what it requires is is energy. Like you need to constantly be protecting that. And and like Rachel gave one good example earlier: really high caliber skeptical scientists and engineers who have been through the experience of doing something that they personally thought was technically unlikely and then having it be successful flips a switch. So yeah, that's like one of the amazing. tricks. That's one of the tricks. Another one is mission. Like, so do they get less and less skeptical as they keep beating no. their own skepticism? You know, what, not, how, what does that evolution look like? They just get more excited to work on hard things. They get better taste. They get better taste. So, 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 cause the, the trick is like, like you don't want to lose your skepticism. That's that's bulk. That's that's how you end up with junk science and junk tech. You know, like like all that all the all the stories you don't even want to hear, right? Like so so the, the I hear them. The, I hear them. Right? Okay. Like you want better taste. Right. Okay. Right. So, so that's what that's what they're building, right? I would argue. Yeah. Okay. okay. So Thank you only and you only do it by being in places that are actually taking tasteful risk. So you see, you just feel what it looks like. Okay. But you can easily be in a place that takes no risk. And you can easily yeah. be in a place that takes tasteless risk. Okay. Right. 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 You know, to those companies. So, so like though that, those are your, that's your, those are your two easy ones. And the hard right. one is building a, a culture of, of having good taste when it comes to that kind of technical risk. Okay. So it sounds like you guys had an amazing culture going sort of early on co-founders that really believed in each other an influx of cash, but something else you had was customers, right? And a lot of the early stage companies on, the phone right now, that's something that they're struggling with. That's their day to day. How, how did you find your earliest customers? How did they, how did you convince them to take a risk on you? That is a good question. Uh, yeah. So that would be, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I think one thing was not um, not being picky, you know, right? Like, so, so like we, you know, we went out and, um, and, I, and I, I, like, I think this is true across, like, again, I'll, I'll, I'll generalize us into like real tech, right? Like, you know, boom aerospace, right? Like they were a batch or two after us. You know, they did some deal with like Richard Branson, like some deal, right? Like, you know, like something, right? Some other, it, it's kind of like show something, right? Like get somebody to bite because investors who are, are going to have a hard time of it, which is, I think, just this is a function of real technology. There will not be an investor who understands your technology better than you. So they're going to look for some other evidence. And I, and, and I think customers is the best one, but there's other things you can pull off too. And, and for us, like we went to industries that were, were less um, biotech industries. We went into fragrances, right? You know, and it was because we could get customers in fragrances. Like we're fundamentally asking a company to outsource their research to us. Right. And in the fragrance industry, they weren't good at biotech. They were good at chemistry, but they weren't good at biotech. And so we could get customers there. Now we knew the budgets were way bigger in biopharma, and that's where like the majority of our new, you know, more of our new deals are coming from now. We never would have been able to get a biopharma customer in 2014 when we we're doing YC0 chance. Like we weren't good enough yet, right? But we could bootstrap, you know, we could start to spin the flywheel in some of these other industries, starting with fragrances and animal feed and da 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 da. And then now, you know, now we walk into the best biopharma labs in the country and like they see leverage from what we have relative to what they have. But that, you know, that took 10 years, you know, so we started not being, by not looking for the hardest customers to get. Right? Okay. So, so first look for the right customers and the don't easiest, be picky, the easiest, but even the, yes. even the it's fragrance, not the right, not the right. right. The easiest yeah. easiest yes, the easiest, right. Cause it's a journey, yeah. right. Like it's a journey. So, well, so, no, this yeah. is an important point yeah. because I think sometimes like I talk to like founders and they're like, I don't know if I should do this deal because of, and eh, they won't pay us X or IP terms or this or that. And I'm like, your failure mode is not like doing the deal and the company stealing your IP. That's what people are usually afraid of. I'm like, your failure right. mode is that nobody will buy what you are making. Yes. Right? Yes. That is the yes. failure mode of every startup, right? Is nobody actually cares to spend money on what you do. Right. Yeah. So I think there is something where sometimes people are a little too like paranoid or picky about their first deal. Yeah. Um, because they worry that they're gonna kind of give away. Yeah, or they'll look bad. Also, that's another one, yeah. right? Like, I, I love these. Like, I don't realize these are like some. I'm still friends with these people, right? Like, like, like they made like an incredible bet on us, right? The, but like, yeah. they aren't the they aren't like the famous pharma companies, right? So, so right. Like, what, like, if you were just thinking like, what's the thing that looks the best, right, to an investor, it wouldn't have been that. But it was like a deal we could get with good people who were smart, you know, like, but and and we had an, we had something to offer. Right? Like, and, and it works. Right. And, and so I think that's the other thing is like, people don't think about the little steps you can take. Okay. They think about, oh, I got to build like the prototype boom airplane. Not true. Actually, the first thing you can do is just get a deal, like just something, like just anything to talk about. Right. Like, you know, and, and then later you'll raise money and you'll build the prototype and then you'll do the next thing. And like, so you gotta, you know, you gotta lever up. I completely agree. I see um, founders shoot themselves in the foot all the time when they're too focused on brand names, brand name customers, brand name investors. Like, no, just start somewhere, right? Yes. So when, once you Gingo do that. Like, Gingo was, was embarrassingly scrappy, right? He, we, and this reflects on us to this day. We still like don't get like, like you know, we have like giant, like a chip, like the size of a boulder on our shoulders, uh, you know, at all times. But like, like that, you know, it's like, we don't get the most of respect. You know, right? Like, <laughs> like part of the reason, like, you know, like look at the science, the engineering here is cool, but like we, we did it all in a weird way, right? We didn't go straight to the to the, like the highest profile names and the highest and so, so like people still give us crap about it. They still right. give you crap about it. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> so what was it? What was that transition uh, like? Yeah, yeah, I feel true. like it's I'm true. just like, it's yeah, true. maybe offline. We're really good. To, you know, like, we're really, all we, we live to serve, right? Like, we just want to serve all these industries, you know, but like, it's funny. You know? Anyway, we get there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what, what did it feel? What did it feel like to take this company that you had bootstrapped, raised money for, found a team public? You know, a lot of founders dream of that moment and then afterwards can be less dreamy but anyway what was what was what was it like for you what was 
Um, obviously, like, honestly, I wasn't sure, like, what to expect going into it, like, you know, um, but, uh, it was pretty cool. Like, yeah. I think it was, yeah, it, was it was pretty cool. cool. Like, um, like we brought the whole company out to like the New York Stock Exchange and we, you know, there were like, you know, friends who came out and like customers Those, those first customers out. were there. Yeah, yeah. First customers oh, that's were amazing there. that you brought your first customers. Yeah, yeah like early investors were there, like advisors who've been with us for years we came out. Yeah, we brought our kids and families, you know. Um, and so like, yeah, it was like all kind of coming together as a community and just like celebrating like, you know, how far we come was like actually like pretty amazing. and. Definitely recommend the New York Stock Exchange if you're going to go public. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's good pomp. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like it's, it's cooler than Nasdaq. Yeah, <laughs> it's cooler than Nasdaq. Small. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of history. You know, it's cool. Yeah, it's cool. But it was, it was like, it, I think it was a good. Um, uh, yeah, it, we, you don't step back that often. I think yeah. is realistic. You yeah, because you're just going, going, going it's on to the next thing, focus on the next yeah. problem, and so to take a moment in time and like kind of celebrate collectively yeah. about like how far we'd all come together. It was like, yeah, that was yeah. good. Yeah, it must've been an incredible moment, especially because you included everybody from sort of every facet of the early days, right? Oh so yeah. Just come together and see everything all. It was, it was a lot of, it was great. Um, yeah. yeah, and then like, you know, being public is, I, I like it. You know, I, I think one of the things we've always faced at Ginkgo is like, again, because we didn't come out of traditional biotech world, like, like people just either didn't know about us, or a lot of people just didn't know about us is the short answer. And, and you're running a services business, like it sure helps if people know you exist, you know, right? And so so your profile just goes way, way up, right? Like you just, there's way more people know about you. It's really hugely helpful for sales and everything else. And we've seen that. Um, yeah. and so, so like, I, you know, I think it's like generally like really healthy for the business, um, but yeah, you just, a lot more noise, but it's healthy. Fantastic, fantastic. So. Before we open the floor to questions, I thought that we would spend some time just talking about the field of synthetic biology more broadly and what you think the future of synthetic biology is, kind of what you're most excited about. Um, yeah, yeah, great question. <laughs> I'll be honest, I don't get this question very often anymore. <laughs> I can say what I'll, I'll say what it is while you think about the future. Okay. okay yeah. All right. So, so the okay. So like, what is synthetic biology? This is another one where like okay. Um. So like the the core idea again, speaking to like a tech and a bio audience, is that DNA is digital code. Okay. Right. And you can read it with DNA sequencing, like genomics, human genome project, all that. And then importantly, you can write it with DNA synthesis, DNA printing, which like again to a non like biologist, you're like yeah, DNA synthesis. I mean, A, T, C, G, 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 G in your computer, hit print, and then like a custom piece of DNA comes out. I mean, like, it's amazing, right? Like, like that is like just amazing. And, and like, and it is totally lost on people that most objects around you do not run on code. Okay, right? Like the chair you're sitting in does not run on code, right? The, table, <laughs> the only two things in that room that are running on code is the computer in front of you and you. Okay, right? Like, like it, it is wild that inside of every cell out there in nature is it like invented the same mechanism to information transfer with high fidelity that we did right like it didn't go analog it went digital like that's that's wild right and so the but the difference is with these cells we didn't invent them so like we don't really understand how they work at a level of each individual piece but boy we can read and write and we can measure them and so the whole theory of synthetic biology was if you can read and write code and you have something that'll run it that's programming so like, okay, like, can you bring in the theory of program? You know, can you bring in some of these engineering theories into what predict what really was a, a field started by the biologists? And the answer to that is like some things and some things not. So I'm kind of curious, like, you know, what what no, relates? You know, but yeah. that, that's the idea. That's the idea behind symbio. So, so it's fundamentally a tools revolution, yeah. right? It isn't. Some people get confused. They think it's like applying bio outside of biopharma. You know, it's like you know, like oh, like making. Um, Renewable nylon is symbio. No, actually, that's industrial biotechnology. In fact, that's been going on for 40 years, right? Like the, the making enzymes for laundry detergent. That that got started at the dawn of biotechnology. You know, Genentech started working on that actually, right? Like da, 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 da. okay. Not not like no, it is a tools revolution that makes it easier to to apply biotechnology across all markets. That that 
that's what Symbio is. Um, where and it's, it's pretty amazing how far the tools have come, yeah. right? Like, I mean, like early on, we would always just talk about sequencing because it was the obvious one that was getting way, way better every yeah. year. And then we started talking about synthesis, um, like DNA synthesis, so writing code, that's obviously gotten a lot better over the years. But now it's like every part of the cycle has gotten better. So CRISPR-Cas monthly made it way easier to edit genomes, right? Which was a bottleneck for a long time. But now you can like, you know, for most organisms, you can just go in and edit the genome now, right? Which was like not a given when we started, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, Amazing. And then, okay, now I can actually just go um, use AIML to like design proteins. Like <laughs> not a given when we got started, right? Um, the fact that our measurement technologies, right? Between next-gen sequencing and, and mass spectrometry, like I can basically know exactly what's happening with my with my um, library design. like. I don't know, the tools have come a huge way and now like like pooled approaches for for designing biological systems are now. So I'm not tra like designing and testing like a thousand designs. I get to do like 10,000 designs, a hundred thousand designs, a million designs, right? At a time. Like yeah, it's, crazy. It's, it's come a long way. And so what's cool about the tools getting so much better is that the envelope of applications that are actually like realistic to go after is like massively expanded. And so that's like why we got into this in the first place, right? There was no like one application that motivated us. It was like, oh man, the sky's the limit if the tools got good enough and like the tools are actually getting good enough. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing I would say is then you start to, like because you can start generating a lot more data and understanding, because remember we don't understand, we didn't design these cells. So the, the more things you get to try, the more your like theory of programming improves. Right. Right? Like. Remember, like the book, like the art of computer science and stuff. Like, you know, like there, like there's like theory, right? You know, it's not just about like the compilers and the debuggers that like let you put the code in and, and let you test how your code performed, which we have a lot of here, you know, in our physical infrastructure. It's also like how good are you at writing the code, right? And like that is getting exciting because like yeah. we've always been anemic in the data we had to teach us how to get better at writing the code. And at least here at Ginkgo, that is now changing. And by the way, for any of our customers who would like to access our infrastructure as a service, also available, huge scale learning, which you can then use to train your models and all that stuff. Like it's really, it's real neat. Sounds valuable. Absolutely. So last question for me before we open it up to the audience is any parting advice for founders in the field who are just getting started? I'd say the typical advice I always give folks is like, don't underestimate your ability to learn, right? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes, I um, particularly for bio companies, you might start with technical co-founders, right? Um, but like literally all of your training up until that point has been how to go into a new area and learn it. Turns out that skill set is applicable even outside of technology and science, right? You can go in and learn about how HR stuff works. You can go in and learn about how to you know, negotiate contracts. You can go in and learn out, uh, how to do sales. You can go in and learn about how to, you know, uh, you know, run your accounting and finance teams, right? Like, and so understanding that, like, that you have a tremendous ability to learn and, and grow as long as you're willing to put in the energy and the effort to, to climb those learning curves is, I think, a really important thing for all founders to appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. Don't build a lab. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Yeah. Go to the cloud. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. And yeah, Reshma, I completely agree. It's a big reason why uh, I wrote my book without a doubt, because you have to be without a doubt that what you're working on is the thing you're most passionate about, but also you have to believe in your own ability to learn, to overcome other people's doubt, you know, your own doubt. So I absolutely love that. And the thing about not starting a lab. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's part of it. Um, okay, let's let's open the floor to questions. I love this one to get us started. In Jason's tweet, he said he'd be talking about dragons. I mean, Tell us about dragons. <laughs> I did not see this. So. <laughs> yeah, I thought that would promote. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Okay. <laughs> I, just, I had to I had to read that one. I, I I'm happy to move on. Unless I mean, 
to start with, we're all in violent agreement that we want there to be dragons. So, so that, just, <laughs> that goes without saying. Okay, right. So that's just the start. I'll just point out they're, they're clearly biological. So you know, my three-year-old and six-year-old boys would love it. That's for sure. Correct. Yeah. Right. Exactly. All right. Now we're talking. Okay. Now, what a larger view here. Uh, like, where does this stuff go in the long run, right? Like, if, if we really are, like, the long view of synthetic biology is to kind of get on a curve like our co-founder, Tom Knight, right? Like, he, he's in his 70s, right? Like, he started at MIT, the faculty, in, like, 1972, right? Like, the refrigerator-sized mini-computer era of computers. <laughs> and Tom did, like, mainframes, punch cards, big computer architect design, okay, right? And so he saw computers go from being something that number one, you had to be an electrical engineer to even know how to program. Number two, you had to be like a wizard, right? Like, like just like a, like a complete genius. Two, now like, you know, like you can go on your, your, your 10 year old and go on an iPad or go on Scratch and, and write code, right? So why can't this happen in biology? <laughs> like yeah. it's gonna happen. Right, like it is going, it is going to happen in biology. Like there is not, there's not like a physical barrier in the way from this happening in biology. It will ultimately get low cost. It will ultimately be distributed. Your kids will ultimately get to design your garden. Okay, and, and like that, that's a really to me like 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 that's a beautiful future, right? Like like there's a, like it, like biology. Yeah. I mean, artists and designers like when they get their hands on a substrate, just are incredible to watch. And like biology is. The most beautiful right so so yeah there will be dragons. i i definitely agree okay one for reshma since it's women's history month any advice you have for women in bio who want to start companies um yeah it's a good question um i, I don't know that i i do actually have specific advice like for for women uh because i think you know being a founder is being a founder and, and what it takes to succeed is the same across uh, across the board. Um, you know, you might you might fight, face some incremental challenges along the way, like, well, let's be real about that. But I also think that it's important to not let that occupy too much of your headspace, right? Um, I try, I try, well, I consider it really important to think about how do I, I like give back and, and like and lift up like other women in the field. Um, I also try not to spend too much time thinking about that, like for myself, because I think it just takes you to a negative place and you can't really afford that um, um, as a founder. And so kind of staying focused on the future and staying focused on maintaining that learning mindset is I think kind of um, critical. Like everybody has their moments of, of doubt and negativity, but but the extent you can just kind of stay focused on what you want to build. Yeah, Rishma, I, I totally agree. I mean, one problem with unconscious bias is that the people receiving it, they are always, you know, part of their brain might always be thinking, is it happening right now? And they'll yeah. expend the energy thinking, is it happening right now? But being a founder is so ridiculously hard. You don't have the mental energy you know, and you don't need everyone to believe in what you, you're doing. You don't need everyone to believe in you. You just need a few, you know, so as much as possible. And of course, it's hard. And of course, it should be acknowledged, but not letting it occupy that mind space, like you say, I think is so important. You know, there's just so much other stuff to do. Um, OK, I like this next one because it's a little bit juicy and controversial, but not in a anyway. So it is. What do you think is the difference between the biotech ecosystem in Boston and Silicon Valley? On the, uh, I guess on the venture side, maybe that's the, or maybe just the biotech in general. I mean, I, I think um, uh, when it comes to the companies, um, I think there's great companies in both places. Uh, I think Boston has really crazy uh drug development, like, like in terms of like the big biopharmas moving their research hubs, it's all come here. Uh, and that's a combination. I think it's like the European companies, it's not that far. And then it historically was New Jersey, because that was like where the chemical industry was. <clears throat> and it's all consolidated to Cambridge. I mean, there's still, a, I mean, there's very big companies out in the Bay Area, but not, it's just gotten so, so heavy. So I think, I think there's a real advantage if you're doing drug discovery specifically to be out here. Um, I, I think that's just true at this point. Um, the, but I, I think there's like San Diego, there's there's San Francisco and Boston that all have like the talent. Um, I think I honestly think there's a real opportunity. I think Sam, I think the Silicon Valley area is like 
like deep culture of product development. Um, and so I, I think if you look at like all the people moving biotech into new non pharma areas, I think that I think Silicon Valley area is going to dominate that. Um, the, the, I just think it's, and you see it like new materials, leathers, mushrooms for this, like all that, like all the cool stuff that you see, like all these new apps in bio, like a lot of it, almost like I'd say 90% or more of those companies are out in the Bay area. Um, yeah. And why common air hopes to be part of that Bay area movement for sure. Yeah. Um, so two questions that I'll ask, uh, sort of back to back. What do you think about AI ML in the space of synthetic bio and any thoughts on how organoid intelligence intersects with SynBio? Yeah, so in terms of AI ML and, and SynBio, I, I mean, I think it has the potential to do a ton. Historically, we've always been data limited in bio, right? Um, and so that's why I think the first place you've seen AI ML like have a real impact in bio is like where we had a lot of data, which is like, how do you take a sequence of a protein and turn it into the structure of a protein? We had a lot of data on that that's been built up over many, many years. It was all available in kind of the public domain via the PDB, the protein data bank. And so that's kind of, I think, partially why that's where AI ML first made its mark in bio is the place where we had the most data. And so I think essentially I see it as like AI ML is going to like have impact, like wherever you can get enough data to make those models useful. So that's the fundamental piece is like, how do you get access to the data sets? Um, because the tools are there now. Um, um, but and so it's, it's the data is the limiting, it's the precious thing. <laughs> you know, what's a good way to generate lots of biological data. Act as a Ginkgo's foundry kind of a service. <laughs> yeah. Automation, right? So, so like this is right, like 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 the limiting reagent for these models. Like everyone's got the same algorithms, right? Like the algorithms are commodities more or less. Like at the edges, they're not, but by the, for the most part, they are, right? It, it, it is it is having proprietary data, right? And then the it, and like it's just the cost to particularly to generate like data systematically that's like reliably comparable. Uh, honestly, I, I believe requires automation. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And then what about this other one on thoughts on how organoid intelligence intersects with Sin bio? I don't know what organoid intelligence is. <laughs> you, 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 you've escaped the bounds of our know-how. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. go Google it really fast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, I, the organoid and intelligence together is what's... Yeah, I don't know what organoid is. Yeah, I know what organoid is and I know what intelligence is. I just don't know what <laughs> yeah, yeah. intelligence is. Remind me to not ask questions that I, I don't know the meaning of. When live on YouTube and LinkedIn. Yeah. I was like, well, maybe they know what organoid intelligence is. Um, now you have seen the challenges of real tech. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. What other questions? Um, would love to hear your take on the line between science and venture-backed engineering. How much does Ginkgo allocate to the unknown versus revenue generating from the known? Yeah, so I would say since we're a platform company, um, you know, uh, uh, like most of our platform capacity is taken up by like customer cell programs. Um, we do reserve a certain portion of it for you know internal R and D. Um, of various kinds to like a lot of it is to make the platform better or to develop IP that we think will accelerate our customers programs. Um, but just as a platform company and since that's our business, that's, that's kind of our focus. And what's cool is that like some of our customers want to do pretty amazing yeah. stuff, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know, the imagination and uh, creativity and, um, and uh, ambition of our, our customers is, is pretty impressive to see. And so we get to do some really cool stuff in partnership with our customers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a weird, yeah, our dynamic at Ginkgo lets us, you know, keep some of that uh, learnings. So that that's one of the big ways we do it here. Uh, I would agree with that. Yeah. Go ahead. When you when you think about um, Ginkgo in five years, what do you see the company working on, or what do you imagine it being with this explosion of data and everything else that we're seeing now? Yeah, I mean, I can I can answer my view on this. I. Uh, I think in five years, like we we ought to be starting to capture like a material chunk of the cell engineering across the 
current applications for biotech. So the, the big, you know, the big three are basically biopharma. Um, and again, half of biopharma is chemistry. That's not us, but the half of biopharma that is biotechnology, uh, ag biotechnology. Um, so like plant traits and biologicals, um, and then industrial biotechnology, like enzymes for laundry detergents, making renewable chemicals, animal feed, things like that. Okay. And so in those areas where people already do biotech, we want to affect, like, it's, it's like w literally what the, remember when there used to be a time where everyone had their own IT department and had their, you, you probably know, but there's there like IT departments and servers and like little teams that ran them all. And like that all got outsourced because it just I do remember that. I'm, I'm also old. Okay. I also had trouble with the fact that this was an unzoom. So yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So it's so all like, you know, the, the, like that, that transition from like everyone having their own small, low throughput, high cost version of something to making use of a centralized infrastructure. I think we can pull that off in the next five years, like, like that. And, and then from there, it's all the new stuff, right? Then it's, then it's dragons, right? Like then it's, who knows what you can do with bio. Then it's dragons. But you start to drive improvement at, at a faster rate than you ever could have in the little server farm, right? Like, you know, we wouldn't be having, you know, all the stuff happening in AI right now had it not been for all the data center drive and then what that drove on all the chip improvements and all that, then suddenly new apps show up, right? That That's what we want to, you know, that's the long game. But in, in, the, in the next five years, it's move share from two people doing it in-house to our infrastructure. Okay, fantastic. So you you talked about, Reshma, um, your customers doing a lot of cool things. So I feel like this question from the audience to take us home uh, what's one recent partner with Ginkgo that you're most excited about in terms of growth and why? Is that like asking your favorite child is or? Yeah. Well, well, what's a cool tech or, you know, or, or anything like, like what technology then? Yeah, I'm excited about. Um, I think what's been cool to see in the past couple of years is just how diverse the set of applications have gotten, right? I mean, we have programs in food, we have programs in agriculture to like address sustainability and climate change. We have stuff to like try to work on metabolic diseases. We have stuff like in gene therapy. It's like, like we had talked about this for a long time, right? But to actually like see it become a reality is like pretty amazing. Yeah, um, to see that the range yeah. could all live on the same platform was yeah. not expected. You know, again, like, you know, we always talk about it, like, we got to make the tools better so that we can serve all these different applications. And it's like, now the tools are actually getting better. Um, and, and that's making a huge difference in the diversity of applications on the platform. And so to me, that's actually the thing that gets me mo the most um, excited and stoked is, is just like how broad a breadth um, that folks want to do out there with biology. Yeah, it's incredible yeah. what the implications are. So Reshma, Jason, thank you so much for being with me here today and talking about the incredible story of Ginkgo. I really appreciate your time. And for those on the call, don't forget that we have another fireside chat with Adam Elliser of Penumbra, who was the founder of the company and now the company has a $10 billion market cap. So rare for founders just like these two to be there kind of the whole way through. And oh, wow. sure. yeah. I had one small thing. I, I would say like the other, thing I would like a small piece of advice is like, and I, Sam's talked about this too, but I, I think like the, the set of early employees that like can grow along with the company, like made all the difference in the world, you know, right? Like that, like they, they, that ends up creating all these nodes, like founder, like throughout the company. And as you get bigger, oh my gosh, it's such a big deal. Um, yeah. you, you know, and so like, I, I would expand how you, how people think about, like, cause I think Weiss is really good about founders and that kind of loses a little bit of the thread on the, on the very earliest employees. And I, and I think that that would be like a, a, a bit of a nudge, you know, like, I, I think that's been as important for us. Um, yeah, we have a lot of founders that helps, but like that extended net has really paid off. No, that's such a great point to end with because, you know, it really takes a lot of people to make a company successful. And um, those early folks end up being like family and carrying sort of the culture of the founders and of the company forward as it grows, right? So absolutely. And um, in, my, in my book that's coming out on Tuesday, I do that. I try to celebrate the early team as much as I can and all of their contributions, you know? So that's wonderful exciting. point. Yeah. Read it. Yeah. Thank you both well, so much. Yeah. Thank you. 
All right. All right. Thanks all. Bye. Thanks. Bye.